So our speaker today is Paul Tukacheski, uh, who I'm sure many of you know. His interest in the Erie Lackawanna stems from his growing up in Booton, New Jersey, uh, within a thousand feet of the Booton line in the era of uh, U-34s and uh, heavy freight traffic in the, the mid-70s on the Booton line. He went to Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, another connection to the EL, and later lived in Dover uh, and now lives in Long Valley uh, near the Highbridge branch where the CNJ EL pool trains used to operate. And as some of you saw earlier, he's working on replicating the boot line in his basement, um, slowly, but working on it. Uh, Paul is a board member of the ELHS and is the diesel locomotive advisor. He's married and has two daughters who are teenagers. And today his presentation is about the anomalies and unique aspects of equipment of the EL, DL and W and Erie. Uh, this is gonna draw on his extensive photo collection and his 30 years of involvement in the world of graphic arts. So with that, I turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Rich. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, it's actually really good to see you all because we haven't been able to have a get together in well over a year now. Um, I may as well just get into it. Um, let me share. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep. All right, great. Um, okay, a vague, a vague title for this presentation. What is normal? Uh, according to Merriam-Webster, the Merriam-Webster dictionary, normal is conforming to a type, standard, or regular pattern characterized by that which is considered usual, typical, or routine. Um, okay, <laughs> and most people, um, well, let me give you a little bit of background myself. Um, I have always had an interest in the graphic arts and just, I'm very OCD about noticing things that aren't normal. Um, back, and this is really dating me, but this year it's been 30 years since I've started doing model railroad decals. I started doing them primarily for myself because <clears throat> the stuff on the market um, wasn't the most accurate. They would just take off the, the shelf typefaces to represent railroad lettering. And I'm thinking back to the Harold King days, all their Erie Lackawanna sets were abysmal. Um, and that just irked me. And every time I saw them, I just want to pull my hair out. So at that point I started to do my own lettering. I learned all the graphic arts tools and um, tried to correct those mistakes. And over the past 30 years, I've probably looked at, and I'm not exaggerating when I say hundreds of thousands of photographs in doing analysis of lettering and lettering positioning, colors, what have you. Um, so I, I guess I'm just trying to state my qualifications that I kind of notice things that kind of stick out and aren't quite right or aren't quite normal. Uh, I will say that the vast majority of the population probably doesn't even notice these things. I'm like, I'm very OCD about that type of thing. So some of the things I'm gonna point out today, most people would not have considered out of the ordinary, but I'm gonna explain why this isn't quote unquote normal. So hopefully I'll teach a little bit about, you know, the styling of um, how the Erie, the Lackawanna and the EL uh, applied their lettering uh, to their equipment and what's considered normal uh, in that area. Before I begin, <clears throat> and those of you who've heard me speak about stuff like this before know I kind of great about this. I know about typefaces. First, I'll do my little short rant. I think Microsoft did the world a disservice by uh, confusing everyone about the term typeface and font. Microsoft introduced the term font to mean any sort of, specifically refer to a typeface. A typeface is the actual um, type family and a font is a subset of a typeface. So for example, in Windows, you have the Arial font, even though that's technically not correct. It should be called the Arial typeface 
And the fonts are Arial normal, Arial italic, Arial bold, etc. So that's the difference between typefaces and fonts. They're really not equivalent. Um, so I'm going to use the term typeface. But when you hear me say typeface, if you're used to the word font in Windows, just put font in the back of your mind that that's what I'm talking about. So um, I know about typefaces. The reason I bring up this little diagram is so you understand when I say Roman Gothic and condensed Gothic <clears throat> in terms of typefaces. These are the three primary typefaces used on the EL and its predecessors. Uh, Roman is a what they call a serif font. A serif is really a little tail and a little embellishment at the ends of strokes. Like for example, uh, the little ball at the end of the six and the nine, and this little tail coming down here out of the seven and also on the front of the seven, that's called a serif. Gothic, and these are generic names. Um, it's not Roman and Gothic are the generic names for a, a, a serif font and a sans serif or sans meaning non, non serif font. Gothic fonts are very smooth and don't have any little tails on any of their characters. Condensed Gothic or I'll just sometimes call it squished Gothic. Uh, the term condensed in typography means horizontally compressed. So you can see it's basically um, a half width version of a Gothic character in this case. So when I say Roman Gothic and condensed Gothic, those are the typeface I'm talking about. One bonus factoid here uh, in Roman, you'll notice the seven at the front of the line is different from the center seven at the back of the line. The seven at the front of the line is a Lackawanna seven. The seven at the back of the line is a Erie and also all the AMC railroads, um, Pierre Marquette, CNO, um, What's the fourth? I can't remember the fourth AMC road. Um, but they had this very distinctive and unique little curled tail at the bottom of their seven, which make their Roman numbers very identifiable. Okay, thus ends my dissertation on typefaces. On, on with the show. First thing we'll look at are uh, is, the, is some freight equipment. And again, I'm consolidating all three railroads into this presentation, but I'll try to do it in the order of Erie, then Lackawanna, and then EL. Now, for the modelers out there, you probably all recognize this. It's the tried and true Ather and 34 foot Erie hopper with a large yellow diamond on it. <clears throat> and I remember growing up, I thought, oh, yeah, that's the coolest thing ever. And then I learned, nope, never was such a thing. except when there was. <laughs> um, now, if you're looking uh, at the backgrounds, Jim Dent's background is at Carrollton, PA. That's the same bridge um, from his background picture. The reason this picture is here is to show that the Erie did have yellow painted diamonds. And OK, granted, it's a black and white picture. But if you look at the two center cars I'm highlighting here with my arrow, you can see the uh, shade of the Erie diamond here is more of a gray. It's light. It's definitely lighter in color than the white Erie lettering on either side on the opposite side of the car. And compared to the car next to it, which has a white diamond, um, you can see the difference there. Um, Dan Bernanke, uh, I, I'm not going to take Dan Thunder because he, he's the expert on this. He's done so much research on this. But I believe the Erie applied the yellow diamonds to hoppers and box cars for, I think, about three months in the 19, in 1944, if memory serves me. Uh, and then they switched the standard over to a white diamond. Why, I don't know. I'm going to guess that to save money, because why do you need to pull out another can of paint for a different color when white will work fine? So that's the black and white version. But if you don't believe me, here's a John Maris picture that I came across a couple years back. Granted, it's a little bit blurry, but you can very clearly see that diamond there is yellow. And this is uh, Glen Ridge, New Jersey on the New York and Greenland Lake in the uh, late 1940s. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, as I mentioned, what is normal? Uh, the Erie normally had, uh, as part of their um, freight diagram or freight lettering diagrams, they had lines above and below the road number. And this was adopted by a couple of railroads in their uh, standards. Um, toward the end of the railroad, the uh, Erie decided, nah, we're not going to do that anymore. So one class of cars was delivered, I think the last class of Erie box cars to be delivered before the merger, without the lines above and below. So not quite normal. Um, while I'm on the topic, uh, I will observe that the Erie and the Lackawanna both had specific lettering diagrams for their equipment that the shops were supposed to follow and adhere to, which kind of kept a look of commonality or normalcy among their equipment. Um, this is an example of where that diagram wasn't followed. Uh, I've never seen a revised diagram that had the lines left off, but there you have it. Uh, the Erie Lock one also had lettering diagrams as well, um, but they, I don't think they updated them over the years. So there, there was some variation as well. <clears throat> This is, uh, for those modelers out there, you may recognize this as a car that was uh, released in HO scale by our friend, the late Ray Threlfall as part of his Rail Runner line. Um, he did an excellent job on the artwork uh, of the model he did. Um, unfortunately, the model, I think he used the regular Atherm Blue Box model. I'm not sure how closely that car represents this prototype. But regardless, the model was done quite nicely. The story behind this car is that this was a test car that was painted up for an Erie Lackawanna Board of Directors meeting in Cleveland to determine what the uh, what the final box car scheme should be. And they determined they wanted a gray car with maroon lettering, but they weren't sure whether or not they wanted the diamond on the car to have uh, a gray center, which is the one you see here on the left, or a white center, which is the one you see here on the right. This car apparently never actually went to revenue service. It was painted up strictly for the board to see. Uh, they brought the board down after their meeting to look at the car and make their decision. And right after the decision was made, it was sent back uh, to be repainted in the final scheme. So if you have one of these cars, they're cool, but they never actually were seen in a freight train. This is not normal, <laughs> um, and I'm still try I still haven't found figure out why this happened. Although there are a couple of theories uh, going on around uh, about this car, um, this one car, this 55 178, was relettered with completely non-standard stencils, uh, non-standard logo. the The diamond isn't heavy enough. That typeface is one that the ELs never used. Uh, same thing for the reporting marks. Um, the theory is that this car got into an offline wreck and whoever was responsible for it did their best to re-stencil as they thought it should be. Um, but this is definitely a unique car. And uh, fortunately, Mike Aravik was able to f get two different angles of it. But it, it looks goofy. You show it to people. They're like, oh, that's not real. But... It is, it's, it's a one of a kind. This is a slide I bought off of eBay last year. Um, I, I put the date on the bottom just to point out this is taken in May of 1982. The car is pretty freshly painted. So we're, we're deep into Conrail. The car has been rebuilt by Meadville because it has the uh, revised side sill here. Uh, I tried scanning this as high resolution as I could to see what color the lettering is. I can't, still can't tell if it's black or maroon, but we can see here it's got an ACI tag. It's got, the, and that's using the EL typefaces. So I, I can't explain it. Uh, the car looks pretty fresh here. I can't imagine that Meadville painted it in 1976 and it lasted another six years and remained this clean afterwards. So this is a mystery to me. If anyone has any suggestions, you can put them in the chat, chat box because I'm, I'm baffled about this guy. Also, also, 
I want to point out, I'm not sure if the color of the car is white or gray. It's, it, it's awfully light colored for what would I would consider to be EL gray. It's another eBay slide uh, I found. I jumped on this one for a couple reasons. You don't see too many double door 40 foot box cars in EL paint. And Larry DeYoung explains in his color guide that um, the 40 foot cars didn't last too long in the EL. They end up being sold off, I believe to the Great Northern. Uh, so seeing an, a 40 foot car in EL paint to me was an eye opener. And even more eye opening is the fact that 40 foot cars, because you had to have room on either side for the doors, didn't leave a whole lot of room for the road name on the left. So the standard EL 18 inch road name, which you see on the gray car here on the right, would not fit in that space. So it looks like Meadville Shops took the seven inch Roman diesel lettering that you saw on the earlier diesel repaints and used that for the road name on the car. Um, it's a very, very unique car. I don't know how many more were painted like this, but this is the only photo I've ever seen of one. If anyone out there has photos of them, let me know, because I'd be curious to see them. Paul, did you mention that was Mansfield? Oh, thank you. Uh, location is Mansfield, Ohio. I believe that's crossing the Pensy. Um, <clears throat> This is a series of cars. Uh, I forget the builder here, um, but there's two things that make this car abnormal. Uh, one, the entire class of cars were delivered with, uh, you see the number 66851. Usually the number is done in nine inch lettering, like the reporting, the EL reporting mark above it. This series of cars was done in seven inch lettering for some odd reason. Um, but what makes this car even stranger is the non-standard DF and the white cushion car lettering. So I'm surmising this had some rec repairs uh, completed and they just happened to not bother with the yellow paint on the cushion car. Another uh, set of cars, this is an as delivered paint job. For some reason, this small class of EL Gons, this 17 to 600 series has this very odd non-standard gothic typeface it, it's you can definitely tell it's different from the el standard they use the standard el uh typeface for the reporting mark and they use the standard el typeface for the uh road name but the numbers for some reason different and it's only this one tiny class that had this uh this is more of a just because it's cool and you don't see too many pictures because they were kind of short-lived on the Erie. Uh, the Erie's 40-foot uh, um, air slide covered hoppers. A lot of people have asked me about the Atherm ones that came out there. Like, hey, the roofs are black. That's not right, is it? Well, it is. Uh, you can see here the cars do have black roofs and gray hatches. Not sure what happened here, but oops. Uh, the Erie, as most of you know, um, painted their covered hopper, just plain old black, white lettering. Very simple, very straightforward, um, very Spartan. And here's an example of uh, one of those cars. You can see the problem with the uh, black paint, and the Lackawanna discovered this as well on their covered hoppers, is that if you were ca uh, hauling chemicals or, or cement that were white and the rain over time would wash it down the sides of the car and kind of start obliterating a lot of the lettering and causing these ugly streaks. So I've seen only two pictures of the Erie having done this, but this is definitely a Meadville repaint of a covered hopper in gray. Now we know the Erie did get three bay covered hoppers from Greenville delivered in gray and the aforementioned uh, Air slides were delivered in gray as well, but all of the two bay covered hoppers they had were delivered in black paint. Very few were repainted in gray. As I said, I've only seen two uh, photos of two of them. This is an example of one of them. Uh, for the Lackawanna fans out there, this is at uh, Lake Junction 
uh, the train is actually being shoved onto what's called the horn track. So Chester Junction is uh, off to the right out of the picture. And the track here in the foreground is the Chester branch. And the crossing with the CNJ would be behind the photographer here. Uh, another unique car, um, I guess this is one of the, uh, let's get this car re stenciled out on the road as quickly as possible. Uh, the Lackawanna lettering is already being to, to fade away. So they just re-stenciled the EL road number on it and stenciled the diamond and the EL road name. All the other lettering is still uh, original Lackawanna. This class of Lackawanna cars did uh, actually make it all the way to Conrail, a good portion of them still in Lackawanna paint. So the original ACF paint job was, uh, was pretty good. Uh, I was very happy to see this or find this photo because it, uh, I know Jay Held would always tell me, oh no, some of these cars, covered hoppers were repainted uh, with maroon lettering. I'm like, nah, nah, nah. And there's never a clear enough photo to show the lettering was maroon. Um, I've got a couple other examples where it sort of looks maroon, but you could say that's, you know, just dirt or what have you. But this car is very obviously maroon. Um, uh, I have photos of four of these cars. Three of them were repainted in Scranton, which I think is uh, a function of why they got the maroon lettering. Um, and what, Mead, Meadville repainted at least one car with maroon lettering, but uh, all these were repainted in the mid-1962 uh, timeframe. Uh, but by the end of 1962, the EL had standardized on black lettering on their covered hoppers. But I always thought the maroon lettering did look pretty sharp if, neat, if they'd stuck with it, but it is what it is. Uh, this is another one of a kind. Um, the uh, only EL cylindrical car that ever got repainted gray. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, whereas the rest of the fleet lasted all the way into Conrail with uh, the maroon, original maroon paint, but there you have it. Uh, I believe that we still have this model for sale. Talk to Jay Held. We have the HO scale Atlas uh, custom run that was done for the society a number of years ago. That's my plug for the day. Uh, I consider trailers to be freight in this case. That's where I slotted this. Uh, the focus isn't the Jeep that we're looking at here, uh, but this trailer over here. It's a former Lackawanna insulated uh, trailer wearing its orange paint. Uh, you can barely see here, but they applied the Erie Lackawanna seven inch Roman road name to it. This is sitting in Bison Yard in Buffalo. Uh, it's just being used for storage at this point, I'm assuming. But I've, I've never seen any of the Lackawanna trailers lettered like that. I, I'm not the trailer expert, so I'm going to defer to those who might be. Um, this is uh, an early EL drop frame trailer. Uh, it's a leaser. You can see the RELZ reporting marks. I'm not sure how many of these they had, but this is the only photo I've seen of one, and I'm not sure how long they lasted. Based on the lettering scheme they're using here, this is pretty early in the EL's lifetime. Uh, this is a later drop frame trailer. Uh, the EL had a small batch of these as well, but the weird thing is at least one or two of these uh, lasted very, very long. Uh, this is a uh, Al Tilton photo taken in Port Jervis, and this is back in 2014. Um, I know one of these was kind of in captive service between uh, North Elizabeth and somewhere else in Northern New Jersey uh, for a private industry. This is a Bob Panisi photo of uh, a former Midwest freight trailer. Uh, the story I heard was that um, they wrecked an EL trailer somewhere uh, out West off EL rails and um, whatever railroad uh, wrecked the trailer uh, got this former Midwest freight trailer to use as a replacement for the EL, which is why they numbered it right at the end of the series, 700999. 
And it looks like they took the uh, placards off the wreck trailer and just kind of reattached it to this uh, in a very non-standard haphazard fashion. Uh, these are pretty elusive too. Uh, these are also uh, these waffle side lease trailers, which seem to have been lettered for quite a few railroads. Apparently the EL had a number of them assigned to them as well. Uh, most people just paid no heed to them because they're just plain red. And uh, since so many different railroads had these same exact paint job, except for the reporting marks, uh, they're kind of ignored. But here's an example of one that was leased to the EL. Now we move to passenger. Um, interestingly, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of variation on the passenger equipment and probably because that is the more public face of a railroad. I mean, your commuters are gonna be seeing your equipment. Uh, they tried to keep to a standard on that. Uh, this is the one loan example of a still well that actually received gray, maroon and yellow paint. Uh, this was the 2650, if I remember correctly. Uh, here is in a train uh, heading west out of Hoboken. And um, all credit to Marty Obed in his uh, great passenger train series in his article, he mentions uh, that these cars were rebuilt uh, again for Port Jervis service. So for a short period of time, it, had its new number, the 2704. You can see the patch where they renumbered the car. And it lasted this way for maybe a month or two before the car finally was repainted in the two-tone green uh, for Port Jervis service. Like I said, not much variation in passenger stuff. Uh, this isn't really a paint job thing, but it's we're talking about what is normal and what is unique. And this was certainly unique. This was Lackawanna's one and only steeple cab electric, which worked to the Wallabout Terminal in Brooklyn. Another equally unique creature was Lackawanna's pair of tri-power uh, locomotives. I believe the New York Central also had these, except they had third rail shoes instead of pantographs. Um, these, when you think about it, you know, back then it was kind of like ahead of its time and every, they say everything old is new again. And today railroads are using uh, battery powered locomotives. Uh, and this is really a precursor, albeit separated by almost 80 years, uh, to today's battery powered technology that's coming to play. And there's been a, it, it's, you have to listen to, uh, there's a lot of wise tales about these that they, uh, they didn't last that long. They kind of didn't work out. I believe they actually lasted 12 years in service and everything I've read, at least from crews you talked to said they, they worked pretty well for what they, uh, they needed them for. So it is kind of a wives tale that these things were a failure and that's why they disappeared. The reason they disappeared is because World War II came around. These started in the early thirties. So they had, you know, a pretty decent lifespan for that period of time. So don't call them failures, call them unique. This is, uh, and this is a good question. And I was talking with Rich Wisniewski about this. I am not sure where this location is. It didn't have a location on the photo. Uh, it's not under catenary and there's this industrial looking background building, but it does look like they appear to be on display. The Lackawanna painted up, um, a group of MUs in this, uh, they called these platinum blondes. It was aluminum paint, gold leaf lettering, actual gold, not Dulux gold, with a thin black uh, border on the lettering. And half the cars they repainted had these black window frames and half of them had gold window frames. Um, they looked really neat. The problem is uh, over time they began, began to be separated from each other uh, for maintenance. And when they put them back in service, they were coupled up to the Pullman green cars and they kind of look silly <laughs> um, as a mismatched train. So eventually the Lackawanna ended this experiment and uh, painted everything uh, Pullman green. 
another view of uh, the cars in Hoboken. And you can very clearly see here the black trim around the windows and around the uh, classification lamps. But everything old is new again. And in the early 1970s, uh, the EL started taking delivery of its Pullman standard uh, diesel liners, or as people refer to them now, the Comet 1 commuter coaches, which introduced the new NJDOT scheme with a dark blue band around the windows with red pinstriping. And the state decided, well, let's try to spiff up the uh, MU fleet. So they repainted the 3596 into their rendition of the uh, diesel liner scheme. Uh, this is the one only car that was ever done that way. Uh, I still didn't get the full story of why they decided not to repaint the rest of the cars like this. Uh, I'm not sure if it's they weathered badly or it's just too expensive or what have you, but there's your unique example of these cars. This is in Dover, New Jersey. And Rich mentioned I lived in Dover and I lived on the hillside over here to the left where the cars. <laughs> on to the cabooses. Uh, not too much uniqueness about the Lackawanna's cars uh, in terms of unique cars among the fleet. Uh, this is the sole example of what I think is unique about the Lackawanna fleet, the 850, which was their uh, initial steel caboose, which was uh, patterned after the design of their wood cabooses. It had the double hung uh, windows spread out along the side. This is the only Lackawanna cabo steel caboose to be done this way. All future cars had uh, uh, non-double hung windows that were lower and more square in shape than rectangular. And I believe this is at uh, Bangor. The Erie, on the other hand, uh, had a lot of flux in their initial paint jobs before they finally found something that worked for them. So here is the C300, which was the first test bay window car. Uh, this car is unique because it had the four windows uh, around uh, the sides of the bay. Later versions only had two windows, one on each side of the bay. And this car is wearing a completely unique paint scheme with the Erie up top, the C300 down below, and the Erie Diamond over on the right and nothing on the bay. Um, if anyone knows where this photo is taken, I'd love to hear it. It's in front of what looks appears to be a freight house. You can see the high platform, uh, but I don't have the location on this picture. Then, like I said, the Erie, I guess, didn't like how that looked. So here's what they ultimately settled with, the scheme we all know and love, the lightning bolt scheme uh, on that same car, the C300. Um, one fast I want to point out, which makes this car also unique, is this car, this caboose wore the more, most paint schemes of, I think, any caboose on the EL. We saw these first two Erie schemes. It later received the Erie Lackawanna early red scheme, which is pretty much patterned uh, after the Erie's scheme. It then received the EL Spartan red scheme. And lastly, it received the gray, maroon, and yellow scheme. Uh, one thing I want to point out here which isn't obvious because I only showed the same side of the car in all these pictures. Uh, the opposite side of the car uh, in EL years had one of the th four windows plated off where the stove was. And you can see where the smoke jack is. So the, the window, uh, the third window on the opposite side of the car uh, had a plate over in EL years. Uh, I assumed it was done in Erie years, but Larry Young told me that, no, that was done in EL years. And as built, the car had four windows on both sides. They later played it over for the stove. Uh, this is a bit of a mystery too. And again, uh, I, I love having a discussion with Dan Bernacki about lettering, eerie lettering. Um, Dan swears there has to have been more than one of these cabooses because they have lettering diagrams for it. But this car, the C200, I believe, is the only eerie Dunmore caboose to get the lightning bolts uh, like the bay windows. Now, you need to keep in mind that the Dunmore cabooses were built prior to the bay windows before the lightning bolt scheme was introduced. Um, so 
I guess after they painted the uh, bay windows and the lightning bolt scheme, they decided to try the Dunmore in one. I'm not sure if they just didn't like the look and feel of how that turned out, but this is the only Erie Dunmore caboose that I've been able to find to ever wear that paint scheme. Um, this is either a one of a kind or a two of a kind. I've seen a photo of one other former Erie wood caboose. Uh, I don't remember its number. It could very well be the same number. So there may be one, there may be two of these cars, but uh, it's the only former Erie wood caboose to actually get the Erie early red scheme with the black centered diamond and the Roman road name on there. This is uh, out in Chicago land to the 04938. Uh, this is in Binghamton, New York, um, a very wacky paint variation on this car uh, with the EL diamond shoved off, uh, offset to the left with the road number centered and the radio lettering on there. Uh, that's another one of a kind, no other EL. Uh, Kaiser Valley Caboose is painted this way. Uh, another bit of a mystery and I've talked to a couple of veterans and they haven't found a rationale for this car either. It appears that this car was painted by the Hornell shops, not by Meadville. This car came out uh, a couple of years after they started repainting uh, the cabooses in the gray, maroon and yellow paint scheme. This has got a completely non-standard scheme. It has a white number without the C in front of it. It has a 34 inch diesel uh, scotch light logo stuck on the side and no other date except for the uh, uh, the standard uh, loop, loop stencil here. Um, I've only seen two pictures of it in service and it's always in about the immediate Hornell area. So I think it was kind of kept there for local use, but um, a very, very unique variation of the uh, green, green, yellow scheme. Now onto the diesels. Uh, we'll start off with the Lackawannas. Uh, nothing unique about the lettering, but this class of uh, General Electric, Ingersoll Rand center cabs, I believe were entirely unique to the, the Lackawanna. Um, GEIR made other versions that were, had uh, uh, a shorter hood on one end. And I think the Bangor and Aristic and the Rock Island had those, but I think the Lackawanna is the only road to have uh, this particular conf configuration uh, diesel from GEIR. And this is at uh, Buffalo. Um, this is to set the normal part. Uh, this is the delivery photo of Lackawanna 903 from their first group of RS3s. Had uh, a Gothic road name in the center, Gothic cab number on the sides and a slightly condensed Gothic on the ends. That is normal. And then at some point, the road name migrated to the top of the hood. And you're probably wondering, well, why would they do that? And uh, I'll have to give Bob Barr's credit because he's the one who kind of did all the research and figured out what was going on here. Uh, if you notice this door here underneath the NN in Lackawanna, uh, you might see there's uh, a bunch of stuff that was done there. It's hard to tell from the resolution of this picture, but the railroad actually went and drilled a series of holes in there uh, to give more ventilation uh, to the prime mover. Um, and because they drilled the holes there, they couldn't put the road name, they couldn't stencil the road name over the hole, so they just moved it to the, to the top of the hood. This apparently is the only R3 where they did that. But it was a precursor to lack one a second batch of RS3s. And again, all credit to Bob Bars because he's the one who did the research on this. Uh, the Lackawanna is the only railroad um, that had phase, I think these are phase 2A RS3s. And all that means a phase 2A unit has screened uh, holes instead of louvers for ventilation. Uh, another reason why the word Lackawanna is high up here because you can't stencil lettering over, over screens. Um, I believe the Santa Fe and a, another railroad had the same phase uh, RSD4s, the six axle version, but the, this is the only 
railroad that had the R3 version of that phase. And I've, I'll say right now, I feel bad for Lackawanna modelers because everything the Lackawanna seemed to get <laughs> were unique, um, which is why it's hard to f find or hard to make models of them, such as this phase of R3. The Lackawanna's first set of FTs at LaGrange uh, EMD. Um, initially, the units were lettered with yellow lettering and numbers. And you can tell just by, from, by looking at this picture, there is no contrast at all between the yellow lettering and the gray car body, uh, which is why it was very quickly changed to maroon lettering and uh, number. Uh, also uh, semi-unique, I think one or two other railroads had these. The Lackawanna is uh, FT short boosters. You can see just by looking at the picture that the booster, the B unit here is uh, considerably shorter than the A units on either side of it. Uh, another photo looking for an explanation. Um, for a short time in the uh, late, or not late, but like a 1945, 46 timeframe, uh, these are Lackawanna 605 and 606. For some reason, they kept them together uh, as a single unit numbered 60. So I guess they were semi-permanently coupled together. Um, and you can see where these kind of covered over the last digit on the uh, number board and on the side of the units. Um, it, they didn't last too long this way and they eventually returned back to their original numbers of 605 and 606. Um, not totally unique, but semi-unique. Lackawanna decided to go for this all gray uh, paint job in an effort to save money. Um, a small number of F3s and I think one F7 got this solid gray paint. It looked atrocious, so uh, the Lackawanna decided to standardize on the passenger scheme, which wasn't cheap to apply, but it looked a heck of a lot better than the gray ghost scheme you see here. Uh, this is kind of a unique unit. Um, after the EL merger, um, the units, uh, the Lackawanna units pretty much kept their Lackawanna lettering. They just got a new uh, EL road number on it. But this is the only freight scheme unit uh, to last until the EL in the freight scheme and it received EL lettering over the Lackawanna lettering. So this is a totally unique unit on the roster. Uh, and I believe this is either Jersey City or, or uh, Hoboken. Um, you can say EMD was kind of hedging its bets when they released these two E8 demonstrators uh, in full Lackawanna paint um, and EMD lettering and sent it to Lackawanna for <laughs> demonstrating. Uh, and yet Lackawanna did end up purchasing these two units. But the one thing most people don't know or maybe for, forget is that these guys actually went back to EMD. You can see here, they're wearing passenger pilots and the Lackawanna's E8s all had the freight pilots. So they went back to EMD, got the, the freight pilots and they actually were completely repainted. Uh, it wasn't just a patch job, they completely repainted it into uh, Lackawanna. Now the Erie side, um, nothing unique about the paint, but the units themselves are unique. And um, they kind of were underappreciated during the course of their lives. They lasted on the Erie, I believe it was eight or nine years. Um, these were test beds for the, uh, the Cooper Bessemer prime movers that General Electric uh, acquired the rights to. Uh, two of the units had, uh, 1200 horsepower prime movers and two of them had 1600 horsepower prime movers. Uh, GE built these uh, Alco FA like body, uh, but they're still relatively unique with the fluted sides. And they served on the Erie, like I said, for a good seven, eight years before returning back to GE, uh, getting upgraded prime movers and then being sold to the Union Pacific where they uh, lasted not all that long. 
Um, what surprised, always surprised me is the fact that the Erie ran these for so long, but you see so few pictures of them. And uh, a couple of people told me that the units ran primarily uh, between Youngstown and um, Youngstown and Meadville, uh, because that was the closest to uh, GE's Erie facility. So their engineers could always come down and see how the, their units were doing. So they really didn't get much uh, traction outside of uh, that part of the Erie. Originally, um, the Erie tend to uh, follow the suggestions of the manufacturers for their lettering. Oh, sorry, jumped ahead. Um, Alco pretty much had a standard paint design for their HH uh, line of high hood uh, diesels. This HH660 is the as-delivered paint job for uh, the Erie. It has the pinstriping coming down along the top of the hood down to a point. We have the pinstripe boxes between the uh, stanchions, the pinstriping around the battery box here, the white painted tires, very, you know, to the nines, classy, and also the, the box around the road number. Um, obviously the Erie later on simplified this just to plain black paint scheme. But for a short period of time, this paint scheme was pretty unique uh, on their switchers. Another early paint scheme that kind of was a flop, uh, one of the uh, earlier S2s, and apparently from what Dan Bernacki explained to me, they actually were delivered uh, with the usual lettering scheme with the lettering being up higher and the diamond on the side of the hood. Uh, this is a later scheme they tried, but didn't work. Uh, part of the reason is the road number, if you see where my arrow is pointing, that little yellow blob in the corner of the cab, that is your road number and class on the side of the unit. Um, so other than the front and the number board, you really didn't have a large road number. So when these guys were going by, the guys in the tower are squinting, trying to read what the number was, and it didn't work out so well. So the, that scheme did not last that long either. This is in uh, Binghamton. That's the Chenango Street uh, overpass here on the left. Uh, that is the Erie scheme that everyone is more familiar with uh, here at Akron is the 518. But even this scheme, uh, again, had its variations. So we have the Erie here closer to the radiator, closer to the front of the unit, and the diamond uh, toward the cab side. And we have this variation where they swap the two. Um, they did this on quite a number of the S2s where they had uh, swap locations for the word Erie and the diamond. Again, no real rationale for that. Uh, this looks unique because it's sort of unique. Uh, the Erie purchased a group of S2s from the DNH, and just to get them in service, it patched out the DNH uh, road name and number and slapped on its own lettering. So the black box around the Erie used to say Delaware and Hudson, and the black paint on the side of the cab covers up the uh, Delaware and Hudson rectangle and number that used to be there. Uh, in time, they were completely repainted, but to get them in the service, they just patched them like this. Another early Alco paint scheme, uh, again, diamond on the side, no lettering on the hood. And again, that little blob here is the number and the classification there, They're almost invisible. Uh, I don't know how a tower operator would see that as it's going by at speed. The other weird thing too, you can see the number boards here appear to be white. And uh, it's another thing Dan and I had a bit of a debate upon. He says, the numbers have to be there. They would not be allowed to run without numbers in the number boards, but every single photo I see of these, they are, they appear completely white. Um, one theory was that they had the lettering on the inside of the number board. So when the light shined behind it, it projected through, but I've never seen a photo of this particular scheme where you can actually see numbers on the number boards. Uh, again, another angle of that scheme is at Glenrock, New Jersey. And again, the number words look white to me, but it looks like there might be something there. I, I just can't figure that one out. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> the first order of FTs, the Erie's first uh, cab diesels um, at LaGrange. And you can see the initial scheme did not have the full bib going up the nose, just had the Erie and the wings uh, on it. Um, I, I love this one because uh, it took me a while to figure this one out. And um, again, most people will look at it and say, okay, so it's a bunch of F7s. What's, what's the big deal about this? Um, I learned a couple things in researching this, which I didn't know. And I had made some assumptions. I assumed that the 800 series was reserved for passenger units. And the 700 series on the Erie was re reserved for freight units. Well, I had my, uh, I was shaken to the core when I discovered the 700 series units were four component units, like an ABBA set. The 800 series units were three unit sets, ABA. Um, Generally, most of the four unit sets were used only in freight service and most of the three unit sets were only used in passenger service. Um, so th there's your factoid of the day because I found some eerie documentation that showed that and I got to thank Larry DeYoung for providing me with some of that. Uh, so what we're looking at here are not passenger units. They are indeed freight units, but these are just a three unit series of freight diesel. So it has an 800 series number, but it's still a freight diesel. Uh, but by this point, the Erie realized, no, we, we need the extra uh, B units. We do want a full four uh, unit set, which is why photos of the 807 are so hard to come by because they only, the set only lasted, I think, for about six months before the Erie went back to EMD and said, can you build us another B unit? <laughs> so EMD uh, did as they were asked. And voila, the 807 ABC became the 713 ABCD. Now, you can see here the new B unit they built, since it uh, was built a little bit later, has uh, far air grills. It's kind of hard to detect. Well, you can see it's a different set of grills, but um, that's your identifying feature of uh, that 713C. So the 807 became the 713. Uh, another unique variation, uh, d as delivered the first six, I'm um, trying to remember that number, uh, four, four or six E8s had these lower wings with a smaller logo at, and much longer wings that wrapped around more to the side. Um, that was quickly changed to the larger 34 inch logo that was centered on the nose door and shorter wings that came to just before the uh, uh, blue green or gray green band here. Uh, this is at uh, Mawa right near where the Route 17 overpass is today. Uh, this is during the Erie Centennial. That's the Centennial train posing next to the E8s. Uh, can't zoom in too much on this, but this is the Erie painting diagram for the two-tone green uh, PAs. Um, the one thing you'll notice here on the back, they had large Roman numerals uh, for the back. But in practice, they end up using large Gothic numerals, except for this guy. <laughs> uh, the 859 wore these Roman numerals to the back for uh, about a year or two when it was repainted. And eventually it, the, those numbers were replaced with the uh, standard nine inch Gothic numbers. This is uh, coming into Port Jervis. And now the EL. Uh, when the EL merged um, for freight, you, they decided to have a separate freight and passenger scheme. The freight scheme was patterned very obviously after the Erie's uh, black and yellow scheme. And here's an example of a switcher um, in the black and yellow paint scheme. It's using uh, condensed Gothic numbers on the ends and on the sides. Uh, it does not have um, the bib, which Erie switchers didn't have either. 
and has a yellow frame sill. So that's quote unquote normal. And then we have examples like this where they started deviating uh, from standards. Uh, this is one of two EMD switchers that got this scheme. Uh, it looks almost like the Erie scheme, except uh, they have this EL diamond on it and the center of the diamond is, is white. Sort of a unique application of that. This is in uh, Nutley, New Jersey on the Newark branch. Here we are in Hoboken. And now they decide to try to spiff up the scheme on switchers by adding these bibs to it. A couple of switchers did get the full bib treatment. And this one is unique because it actually has the road number stenciled under the radiator. Uh, it's the only uh, freight scheme switcher to get that. Uh, another unique variation, uh, another freight scheme switcher that has the bib and the only one that ever got the diamond on the nose under the radiator, Hornell, April 66. This is one I found on the web, the Jim Parker photo. Uh, I believe this is Youngstown and this is the 901. Uh, one of two, the two passenger uh, RS2s, I believe that handled the uh, Cleveland Youngstown train during the early era. Uh, what's unique about this, it's got no road name. Uh, it's sister 900 got the full road name treatment, but the 901 for Sabrina never had the EL road name when it was painted up in the black and yellow scheme like this. Speaking of no road name, here is the 1153. Uh, I believe this one's at Bison Yard in Buffalo and it's black and yellow scheme. Uh, making it unique is no road name and it has the standard Gothic numbering, which was not quite normal, although a few units did have that, but the lack of road name is, is unique here. Again, like they did with that covered hopper, um, just to put some semblance of an EL image on it. Uh, two of the Lackawanna's H1644s received this temporary patch job where they slapped a bib onto the end of it with an EL diamond uh, and they applied its new numbers to the end and also the side, but they kept Lackawanna on the side. Um, one of the two, I believe the other one was 19, the, oh, the other one was 1934. The 1930 uh, lasted all the way until it was sold. Um, I guess for resale to Mexico, wearing this scheme. Uh, for comparison, behind it is one that's been fully repainted in the official black and yellow paint scheme. And this is a Scranton. Uh, this is the 7314, if memory serves me. This is the only photo I've seen of this unit. Um, and it is the only FA to get the lack, the, uh, the Roman road name on it. Uh, most of the FAs had just the plain diamond on the side of it, kind of conforming to Erie standards. This one has the full road name on the side and a white centered diamond uh, on its bib in the black and yellow scheme. It's uh, fairly unique. This is uh, somewhere on the West End. And Pond Eddy, we have uh, similarly unique variation on, um, in this case, an F5 or phase four F3, uh, the 7091 in, in the black and yellow scheme. Uh, very, very few F units had the full road name in the black and yellow scheme. They, they kind of resembled the FA trailing it with just the diamond. Um, this is kind of a unique treatment, although not totally unique, uh, but this is the only train master that uh, got a solid yellow end applied to it with a standard maroon diamond. Um, not sure why that was done, if that was a rec repair, um, not sure if that was how it was originally painted or not. I haven't been able to find uh, any other photos showing an end that didn't look like this, but it's not 
totally unique because they applied the same thing to this Jeep 7 seen here at Bangor um, in its black and yellow scheme. It has a solid end with a maroon diamond decal on it. The opposite end, by the way, was the standard bib. It wasn't a yellow end on each end. So I, I'm guessing both of these were the result of wreck repairs. It's the only thing that sounds plausible, plausible to me. Uh, back to the switchers. Uh, here's the only EL switcher, in this case, the NW2, and only the NW2s you could do this with because they have the shorter uh, radiator intake on the ends. This is the only NW2 to get the EL diamond on it in the gray maroon yellow scheme at Binghamton. Uh, also fairly unique, um, this batch of NW2s, uh, five of them had, uh, you know, they're always proclaiming radio equipped. Well, these had the original wagon wheel style antennas that you found on the uh, bay window cabooses on them. Uh, they tend to blend in in most pictures, so most people don't spot it. But the first time someone pointed out to me, I, I was just completely dumbfounded. It was only these five units that had those wagon wheel antennas on them. You can see that same wagon wheel popping up here, but making this one even more unique is it has a black roof on it. The only gray, maroon, and yellow switcher that I found that has that. Okay, uh, I'll fess up. This technically isn't EL. We're, we're into Conrail at this point. Uh, but for some reason, and it seems that the folks in Buffalo uh, were the ones who were doing this. Um, this switcher and I believe three or four Jeep 7s, for some reason, they patched out the EL road number and re-stenciled it with the same exact number, but using uh, a mishmash of different typefaces that they'd available to them. Why they did this, I have never found uh, a good explanation for but there's an example of the switcher with the uh, Buffalo patch job. And we'll, we'll see an example of the, uh, the Jeeps later on. Um, for those of you who bought the Athern S12, uh, here's your example of why they painted it the way they did. This is the only Baldwin uh, to get this scheme with the EL diamond on the side in the green, maroon, and yellow. I believe Atherin didn't even do this number, if I remember correctly. Uh, another unique Baldwin. This one got white numbers on the on the side of the cab for some reason. Uh, unique. Uh, well, two units unique, I guess. Um, the 1200 and 1201 were the only two Jeep 7s to have the old school barrel headlight, the steam era headlight. Uh, I'd mentioned the Buffalo renumbers and here's one of the Jeeps. By this point, it's uh, at Altoona uh, for work. Uh, but here's an example. They, it looks like they use a combination of former Pensy or Penn Central numbers and other railroads numbers to reletter it. But, it's still a mystery why they re-stenciled it with its original EL number, as opposed to whatever its new Conrail number is going to be. If anyone knows why, put it in the chat chat box. I'd love I'd love to hear. Uh, the unique Jeep Seven of the fleet, the twelve thirty three, was the Jeep that was destroyed uh, when the runaway. Uh, kind of cars came rolling out of Port Morris and slammed into it at Lake Junction, New Jersey. Um, it was taken up to Hornell, which did a really good job completely rebuilding it from the ground up. Uh, but what makes it unique is it's the only Jeep 7 that ever had the white number boards. Here it is at uh, BD in Binghamton, Binghamton, crossing the Erie as it uh, heads up toward Bevere Street. Uh, another unique uh, 
freight Jeep Seven. This is the only freight Jeep freight Jeep Seven. Um, you've probably seen passenger versions of the Jeeps in this scheme, but this is the only freight Jeep Seven to receive the gray maroon yellow with the Roman lettering above the band and the black roof, which you can sort of make out a little bit here. This is at Washington, New Jersey. Uh, another unique variation on the Jeep 7s is this one that received Roman lettering within the band, condensed Gothic numbers, and black roof appliances. And this is the only freight Jeep to get this variant. And I'm not sure who was repainting these. It was Hornell, if it was Meadville, Scranton. Um, I know the Scranton shop tend to have a lot of uh, levity in the stuff they did. So I'm not sure if this is one of their products or not. Uh, there were two or three uh, R3s based out of Marion that uh, they call them the sport models where they doll them up with black roofs, uh, Roman lettering and the condensed Gothic numbers in the cab. Uh, They're kind of a unique fixture to marry and I, they kind of made them their own. I mentioned that Scranton seemed to have a little bit of levity in terms of what they did. And uh, we saw before they had the maroon lettered uh, gray colored hoppers. Here is, <clears throat> the 1934, which was the other unit that had the bib on the ends and the black yellow scheme and the Lackawanna lettering. Um, and they took it upon themselves to repaint that unit in full EL gray, maroon, and yellow. It's the only H 1644 to ever get painted gray, maroon, and yellow. And apparently it really irked management in Cleveland because um, shortly after they repainted it, the entire fleet was retired and went to Mexico. Uh, but the Scranton guys did a really nice job on it. Um, I'm sure they caught some flack for it, uh, but we're all the better for it because uh, it looks really neat. Kent, Ohio, um, a C425 wearing Roman lettering above the band instead of maroon lettering above the band. Not sure if that was a wreck repair, uh, it seems awfully odd that they would repaint that that way, but there you have it. Behind it, you also see another unique unit, uh, the 6322, uh, an F7B that has a diamond on the side with a white center, which was also a unique B unit. Um, not the best picture. It's a neat picture because it's a night shot. Um, and it dawned on me when I, I saw it, I'm like, something's bugging me about the picture and I finally realized why this is the only C424 and most of you will recognize that we're, they were delivering black and yellow like the trailing 2405 but this is the only C424 to get the uh, gray maroon yellow with the Roman lettering um, all the other repaints were done um, with the gothic lettering in the middle band that most everyone is familiar with so this is probably an early repaint due to, again, I, I'm theorizing a wreck repair because this was only applied um, in early to mid sixties in that variation. And yes, it's dated 1165. And again, I have to fess up. This is technically not uh, an EL picture, even though it looks like it. Uh, this is a Conrail era shot. Uh, we can, tell because we have the Pennsylvania cab uh, signal box mounted on the, the walkway here. Um, but for some reason, Conrail pulled off the diamond and re-stenciled it with EL done in the Penn Central typeface. I've heard different stories about it, and this, by the way, is in Croxton, uh, that this unit was involved in a grade crossing accident and for recreation uh, accident recreation purposes, uh, they legally had to convert it back to look like an EL unit, even though it hadn't had any other work done to it, like a Conrail number. Um, that's one theory I'd heard. I'm not sure how valid it is, but if someone can come up with a better idea, I'd love to hear it. 
Um, in the uh, late 60s, the EL uh, did a swap with the Delaware and Hudson. The DNH ended up getting uh, EMDs, uh, SD45 demonstrators, a trio of them. And they quickly realized they were uh, orphans on their roster of primarily ALCO and GE power. So they decided to swap uh, their three SD45s to the EL for three of EL's U33Cs, of which the DNH had quite a number of. Uh, once they realized Conrail was a thing, um, in the ve in either very very late 1975 or very early, like January 1976, uh, the three units were returned to their respective railroads. While they were on the DNH. The DNH did make a couple modifications to kind of conform with their standards. Here's an example: the 3301 received a gyro light while it was up in the DNH, and when it was returned uh, to the EL, uh, the EL really did not want any DNH image to uh, to appear on their railroad at this point. So they these things were repainted immediately when they arrived, uh, and they kept the gyro light on the nose here. Uh, the 3302 did not get a gyro light, and you can see it trailing here. Uh, and this is after it came back uh, and was repainted. Uh, the 3303 did get a gyro light, as you can see here. So these are after uh, they were both repainted when they came back. But apparently, the gyro light must have been given the railroad problems, or they didn't want it, because uh, before Conrail even showed up, they decided to get rid of them, just plate over the gyro light. And you can see that on the 3303. I think the 3301 kept this gyro light into Conrail because I've seen pictures of it in Conrail paint still with a gyro light. So those are uh, kind of unique on the roster. I'm sure most of you have seen this um, GE when they delivered the U33Cs, the first six or the first batch. Um, Someone at GE must have misread the painting diagram because the diamonds were inverted. Um, white diamonds with a maroon center as opposed to uh, the other way around. Uh, those were uh, quickly remedied with uh, new decals within a month or two after delivery. Now, I mentioned before that the, the DNH swapped their 3SD45s to the EL for their U33Cs. This is one of the three that were swapped to the EL. Um, I'm not sure who did the painting, if the EL repainted it when they arrived or if the DNH repainted it for them, but uh, here's the 802 as it arrived uh, after the, it came on uh, the EL from the DNH. The one thing you'll notice here is that the stripe is actually a little bit lower on the body. Usually it's kind of up, snugged up against the cab window, but you can see here it's down a little bit. And for some reason, they decided not to center the road name. It's a little bit too far forward. Um, glancing at it, most people wouldn't notice that. Uh, the only reason I spotted that was when I saw this Larry Young slide of the unit, the opposite side of it. Um, you'll see that the stripe, first of all, the road name again is, is not centered. But if you follow the stripe, it goes across, it hits the dynamic brake blower duct, and it jumps up by a couple inches and then comes back down to continue. I'm like, that is really odd. So I looked at through my collection at more photos. There, there's a better angle of that 802. And here you can very clearly see it's not just jumping. You can see the entire housing, because the housing actually has a lip on this side. Uh, the entire housing is misaligned or the stripe is misaligned with the uh, stripe on the opposite side. So the more pictures you look at, there is the 803. And will you look at that? Its stripe also dips down and comes down, and then comes back up again. Now you'll notice its stripe position is more standard. The road name is centered. The stripe is kind of snugged up right against the bottom of the cab windows. So. I'm surmising that at some point they were working on the two units and they swapped dynamic brake uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm dynamic break traction motor house are blowing uh, housings between the two units. I and mean, that's why the 803 got the lower stripe from the 802 and the 802 got the higher stripe from the 803. Uh, also unique, and you can almost see there the remnants of it. Uh, the black number board in the 803 used to say 3803 because that was the number it was supposed to have when it arrived. But at the last minute, they decided to keep the original DNH numbers and they pasted over the 803. And eventually, this got new number boards anyway. That's another unique facet of the 803. It's the only one to get the black number boards uh, was being uh, delivered to the EL from the DNH. This is a Rich Panisi picture in Dover, New Jersey. Um, I didn't notice this until Rich actually pointed out uh, to me. If you look at the stripe and you follow uh, the handrail, you can see the stripe is actually getting narrower as you go toward the back of the unit. Uh, so maybe the EMD paint guys uh, They've had a little bit too much to drink for lunch that day before they started laying out the masking for this, but um, that's a very unique unit. No other unit has that stripe narrowing. And even more baffling uh, is why this is the only SDP 45 to be delivered with black glass number boards. No clue. Every other unit in the order had the regular old white number boards with block numbering like the 3643C trailing here. Another thing you can't find an explanation for, but it is unique and not normal. <clears throat> this is something uh, uh, you don't see many pictures of because they tend to get dirty, but the EL did apply pilot or uh, striping to the plows on two of their units. Uh, this is the 3667, which is one of the uh, rebuilds from the uh, wreck in Ohio. Um, I don't think the stripes were applied when it got rebuilt. I think that came afterwards, but um, they were applied, as you can see here. Uh, this one, the stripes go all the way out to the edges of the plow. And the other unit that got a striped plow was a 3663. This one has a yellow border on either side of the plow. Uh, otherwise, it's identical. And you can see here by the, the staining of the MU hoses leave that uh, is left behind in the plows, uh, I can see why they didn't go full bore applying stripes to all the, railroad, the, the plows on the railroad. Um, the EMD painting guys, again, we're uh, not paying attention to the painting diagram. And the 3670 is the only ST45-2 where the black on the roof came all the way down to the edge of the cab instead of stopping near the top like that. Uh, to their credit, Atherin correctly replicated this on their HO model of the 3670. And this is another one that I'm still trying to find a rationale for, uh, the 6112. Uh, former LAC 1 F7B was repainted very haphazardly in a solid maroon paint job. And you can see there's no real masking done along the top. There's a lot of overspray. Uh, and it just has a yellow road number stenciled onto it. Um, not sure why they didn't bother with the full paint job. Uh, the unit from photos I have appears to have been repainted around November of 1975 and it lasted this way all the way to Conrail there. I have pictures of it in the Altoona deadline wearing this scheme. Um, it seemed to spend its time uh, in and around the Youngstown area uh, and really didn't venture too far out beyond that. And it seemed to be used in local service. It wasn't used in road service. So a lot of mysteries around it. I have no clue. Um, I know Larry DeYoung reached out to Dick Wells, who used to be in the Hornell shops. He had no, he had no explanation for it either. So again, something that might never be answered, but it's unique. 6321, uh, F unit that when they repainted it on this side did not get an EL road name. It did get a white number board on it, uh, and the number board, which you can't see in this photo, but the opposite number board is still black. So another very unique locomotive. 
I point out the 6322 in a photo before in the background at Kent with the white diamond. Uh, here it is again, and this is the same unit, but this is the opposite side of the unit. Um, it had some damage to the original uh, grill that they had on this side of the unit. So the EL cobbled together this homemade grill replacement, which is extremely unique, but it's only on this side of the unit. So if you see other photos of the 6322 and you're like, oh no, it still has the original grills. Well, that's because you're looking at the wrong side of the unit. And there you go. There's the opposite side of the 6322 in Scranton. Ah, uh, da, 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 da. I need to pause for one second. I need a bathroom break, so uh, I'll be back in one second. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, continuing. Um, here we have a uh, freshly repainted uh, FT. This is up in Maybrook, a Bob Collins photo. And what makes this guy unique is um, they're using the e or Erie style radio equipped stencil, but they left, left off the equipped part. So it only reads radio. Uh, which is kind of a, like a Lackawanna thing, but I'm not sure why they did that. It's only you and I've ever found that uh, had it letter that has the logo lettered this way. Uh, another complete repaint, but this time they use the Lackawanna style radio on the front of it and the condensed Gothic lettering at the back. And that's the only you and I've ever seen done that way. Um, this is 7112 and F7B, and this one is missing the yellow stripe that runs down the maroon band. And this is also another model that Atherin did correctly in their Genesis series. Um, it looks wrong, but photos don't lie. This is how it was painted. Again, not sure why, but it's the only you never seen painted that way. Uh, the FA2s and the gray, maroon, yellow, they were a whole bunch of uniqueness. Um, there were only four FA2s, two FA2s and two FB2s that received the gray, maroon, and yellow scheme. And each one is unique. Um, 7381, as you see here, has the maroon band with the yellow Gothic lettering in the band. The 7344, has the maroon band with the maroon Gothic lettering beneath the stripe. The 7362, gray, maroon, yellow with the with Roman lettering beneath the stripe, which is unique for all B units. I think it's the only B unit that actually has the Erie Lackawanna road name on instead of just a diamond. And they, I don't have a picture of the other FA2 because that's just a regular uh, gray, maroon, yellow with the diamond scheme. I'm trying to figure out why I have this picture here. Oh, okay. This is here just to demonstrate um, 
paint schemes. Uh, the early paint scheme used on uh, most EL cab units, E8 and F unit, or E units and F units, uh, used this Roman seven inch lettering that you relock one beneath the maroon band. The later variation that more people are familiar with is the uh, yellow Gothic lettering within the maroon band. That's when they started patching out the portholes. So that's, I call that early gray maroon yellow and late gray maroon yellow schemes. Um, kind of unique is that the 817 had the early scheme all the way into Conrail. It's the only unit to survive wearing the early scheme with all its portholes intact. A little worse for wear, but it, it made it. Uh, here's another odd variation. Um, the 814 had this version uh, for a short while before the portholes were patched where they actually crammed the road name between the portholes in the maroon band. Only even if they get this paint job. On the 812, they did uh, the early scheme version with the lettering beneath the band, but this time in nine inch Gothic, as opposed to the seven inch Roman. The 823 had a similar variation, except the road name was pushed further back on the car body. And it had the band with the portholes filled in. There we have the 813 again. Uh, now the portholes are filled in and the road name is down here in seven inch Roman. Now this is perhaps the most unique of the EL uh, E8s, the 818, which I don't know how a set of grills gets damaged like this, but it looked atrocious by the time uh, it got to Conrail. Uh, this was an easily identifiable E8. It's the only one that had this horrific grill damage to it. Uh, similar variations of the PAs. Um, the trailing EA here is in the uh, the early gray maroon yellow with the uh, Roman seven inch lettering. But the 850 here has not same unique variation as that, that the E8 had um, with the nine inch Gothic lettering above the stripe in the band instead of on the stripe. Uh, this I believe is Marion. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, people. Um, it's the B65, and the slug mother is the 1857. Um, and there's got to be a story behind this guy as well, and I'm trying to decipher that. I'm actually working on an article for the Diamond on the EL's fleet of slugs. Um, the 1857 was not a slug mother for all that long. Uh, and what makes it even stranger, here it is, uh, it has the early variation where it has the lettering below the maroon band, but this one is done in Gothic. And it only lasted for a few months this way. Because it was, late, it was later repainted where they put the lettering up in the stripe. Uh, I believe by this point, this Buffalo it's at now where it moved to. Um, one other unique thing I want to point out about this and I haven't found anyone who could explain what this all is. It has a little welded platform on the end to hold the firecracker antenna. Now, ostensibly, I assume that would be for radio. I'm not sure if that's radio to uh, other locomotives or radio back to the yard office. And then there's this appendage on the right hand side here. As best I can determine, it's also got a little platform. It almost looks like a wind speed indicator. Uh, and I don't believe, let me go back to Marion one. Yeah, it's on the Marion one as well. Um, I, I have no idea what those are for. I have photos of the unit um, in the scrap line. Uh, and these uh, 
appendages were taken off. The platforms were still there, but they were taken off. But they only seemed to be on the unit when it was in uh, slug mother service. Another mystery to be solved. But uh, that was very unique to that particular unit. And I think I've talked long enough. <laughs> um, let me stop sharing. Hey, Paul. Yeah, I just had a question. What? Why were they? Why did they close up the portholes? What was that all about? Uh, the problem with the EMDs and portholes, and if you look at other railroads, they they did this as well. Um, the porthole gaskets didn't work all that well and rainwater tended to seep behind the portholes and start mm -hmm. rusting out the body panels. Oh. So when they replaced the panels, the railroad was like, well, we don't want to waste the time cutting out a new hole. They replaced it with a plain piece of sheet metal. And that's why they started replacing the portholes. Oh, thank you. And it, it wasn't something unique to the EL by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> hey, Paul, great job. Mike Pavlo here. Fa fantastic job. I, I noticed maybe you can pinpoint it for me um looks like in the early 70s sometime uh the the nose logos on the locomotives changed to a vivid red versus the maroon to match the band was there uh, like a misorder of hundreds of logos and they said let's use them or what's the story behind that um no and yeah i've uh, other people asked me this as well um what they did uh around 1973 or 74 the el started switching to scotch light diamonds uh the problem with scotch light is you only have a certain amount of colors in the scotch light palette so they picked the closest color they could get to maroon and the other thing with scotch light too depending on where the sun is in the sky what angle you're looking at it that logo can go from looking like it's maroon to red and i've got quite a few pictures that show it looking almost like an, a bright orange Oh, so those, those just, were like an iridescent decal that, that glowed under light. Exactly. Okay. Um, and, that, and that's why you get that weird change in color. So if you look, if you see one that has a different colored logo, uh, I'll challenge you, go and find other photos of the same unit in about the same time frame. I guarantee you it may appear different in color. So you solved the mystery that's been, that's been, uh, bothering me for decades. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it's all that's all just scotch light. Okay, um, cool. Actually, when, I, when I did the decal set for the EL diesels, I actually made a version of the diamond that was that orangey color. If you really want to capture that effect, but that's that's all because of scotch light. All right, cool. it, it wasn't a misorder. It's just uh, it's a function of how that scotch light works. How, um, yeah. Thank you again. Great job. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Um, Paul? Yes. Uh, I noticed that B unit that was all maroon. Um, it looked like it was a control unit. Um, there's a window to the left of the door. Um, so I just wonder if that was why it hung around town so much. Let me go back to that pic and take a look. Uh... Oh, 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 um, no, you know what that is? Um, I can pull it up if you want to see it, but that's not a window. Uh, oh. The Lackawanna, um, when they got their uh, F units, they opted for these really big um, headlights on the ends of their units. That's like a very, that's a very, a very steam era like light on the Erie had much smaller end headlights. Um, but that, that's not a window for a control operator. That's actually a really, really big headlight. With, I can with see where the, we might think that's a headlight. With or, the uh, lens uh, broken, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. The lens, the, the glass. Yeah, the glass yeah. is broken. Or missing. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I, I can show you other pictures of Lackawanna F unit ends where you can see the, the large headlight compared to what the Erie had. Because that, but that's a former Lackawanna unit. Right. Uh, Paul? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, early on in your talk, you mentioned lines above and below the um, reporting marks and numbers on freight cars. That was a master car builders and subsequent ARA 
um, rule, which was dropped in later years. I don't have the starting and ending years at my fingertips right now, but it was actually part of the uh, national standard guidelines for freight car lettering. Oh, okay. Can I know other road, like the, Pen the Pensy did that. Um, a couple other roads did that as well. I did not know, yes. but thank you. That's good to know. That explains that. Uh, let me look through the, wow. It's a lot of stuff in the chat window. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to skim through this really quickly here. Um, Paul? Yes. Yeah, it's John. Um, yeah, I made a note about the hyphen. Somebody, you know, originally it was Erie hyphen Lackawanna, and then mysteriously the hyphen disappeared. It wasn't mysterious. I think that's when uh, William White came on board in 1964. Okay. He decreed get rid of the hyphen. Okay. Um, and that, that's you can tell the later repaints. If it doesn't have a hyphen in it, it was like a post-1964 repaint. But that, that was a William White decree, like, no, nope, get rid of the hyphen. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm just skimming through here. Oh, thank you, Mike Sly, for the comment on the double door boxcars. The so question was this for the Hoboken terminal? I'm assuming. Oh, that, that's a reference to the uh, the MU. Yeah, that was, yeah, they, they did go into Hoboken. Uh, the owner of Trainworks said he will do the EL drop frame trailers. Uh, all right, someone give me contact and I'll get him pictures. <laughs> I have artwork too if he needs to letter it. Uh, I thought the B&M had one like the deal. Okay, that's, I think you're right. The B&M might have had those. Um, that's right, the B&M was the other road that had the uh, GEIR center cabs. Thank you, Joe. Oh, and John's comment, which we just addressed. Uh, I've been trying to get tangent scale models to do an IC bay window caboose and Erie and EL. Yeah, we've been all, everyone drop them an email. If, if they get enough requests, they'll do these things, I hope. I'm hoping, hoping, hoping. Uh, <clears throat> oh, thank you, Mike, too, for the dates on the uh, the GE test units on the Erie. Now, I, m m Mike Sly comments that the 807 was ordered as passenger but converted to freight. Um, but because me and Larry Dion were going back and forth on this, and um, he th thought, um, I, I believe the 807 actually came after the E8 arrived in the property. Um, and I don't know. I, it, it, it's, I, I always thought the same thing, too, that it was order as passenger, but by... <clears throat> By that point, they had the uh, all those E units. They, why would they bother ordering the F3s? Um, so that's another theory. Uh, Yates had sandboxes. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure when the Erie, uh, the E8s got their third uh, sand filler not soon after uh, they were delivered. It happened pretty quickly. Why? I have no idea. Uh, extra, extra sand capacity, but I'm, I'm not sure. That's, that's still kind of a bit of a mystery too. Uh, EMD yard switchers had a unique outboard handrail arrangement. Uh, yeah, and that's true. And it's the bane of my existence as a modeler because I can't find anyone who can make the correct stanchions to use on RHO scale models. Uh, I'm hoping someone for Pito is watching. Uh, they have all the correct information they need. Don't worry, their E8s will be correct. Um, and they'll be likely very nice. I'm really looking forward to those. Uh, it's, it's, 
Sorry, just looking for questions. Thank you for the compliments, everybody. I appreciate that. Uh, swag on the... Um, Jim G. Hi, Jim. <laughs> if it's the same Jim Jarofsky, I'm assuming. Um, your comment on the uh, um, the wind speed indicator about the cars rolling back up the uh, the hump at Bison Yard. That was my original theory as well. I figured it would let the, en the engineer know, you know if the wind was too strong to bother pushing it down the hump so it didn't come back. Uh, but the only thing that that first photo I showed where it was in Marion, it had on there too. And Marion, I don't think, had issues with wind blowing cars back up the uh, – the hump as you would see in bison. So I, I don't know. I, I it's, it, it's still a mystery. Uh, we discussed the hyphen missing out of the road name. Uh, the Joe Meyer asks, was the 8007 the only car painted uh, that way on one side with the two diamonds on the gray box car? Uh, yeah, Joe, I think they only painted the one side of the car for the, uh, the board of directors. I don't think they painted the entire car. Paul, uh, I, this is, I don't know if you can see this. This is uh, F3s, I think, from a postcard passenger service, okay. 1949, Elmira. All right. Is there a question or is just a no, somebody had a, a, a comment about the first sets of S, F units were used as passenger units. Oh, well, the the the, um, the 800s, <clears throat> which, again, I used to think meant passenger, but 800s just mean ABA, um, according to an Erie document that uh, Larry DeYoung provided me. Um, and that's an example of one of the original ABA uh passenger F3s. Now, the Erie didn't use ABA units in freight service. Uh, they used ABBA, and those were the 700 series. Uh, and, and corresponding that too, note that the FA1s and FA2s were also numbered in the 700 series because they were ABBA sets. Um, so it's still a mystery about that 807 ABA set. Uh, well, we know why it's got the 800 series number because it's a three unit set. Um, but why they decided to get something that was destined as a freight unit as only a three, uh, three component unit as opposed to a four component unit. Uh, weren't the first three sets of F3s first used for, as passengers for a short time, but you know, have steam generator capacity for long distance trains. Uh, I do, yeah, I remember reading that in the Stauffer book too. Uh, I have nothing to dispute what he says there, and it does make sense. Um, and I think the E8s kind of took care of that issue with the steam capacity on the long distance trains. Uh, let's see, we got more stuff here. Uh, I question whether that last photo was Marion. Okay, uh, from Ralph. I, I have the notes somewhere where it is. I, I could very well be wrong. So if, if you don't think that's Marion, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Um, from neutral angle. Okay, so then so the wind meter hump engine thing might be plausible. Um, but again, I've not found anyone. You figure someone would know about this, but anyone I've ever asked, and I've asked a lot of Buffalo folk about it too, and they, they never even heard of that. Oh, that's that's actually a good point. Uh, the comment here from Ralph. Hi, Ralph. I'm not sure what your last name is, but um, it says, hence the, wind hence the wind meter on the hump engine may actually have been in use for the hump computer's retarder force calculations. That is the most plausible theory so far, because you got the wind speed indicator. That little antenna is probably to communicate back sending that data back to their computer to do that. That sounds very plausible. Um, 
Yeah. That's actually a very good idea. Uh, da, 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 da. The 807 set were delivered coincidentally with the, the units. The change could have been changed before they were delivered. The three and F units were assigned west of Marion. Mike Sly. Mike, uh, are you talking about for passenger or freight service? Uh, regarding Mark Barr's limited in supplement number one, the 1961 AAR interchange rules. Okay, so that would explain why the last order of Erie boxcars didn't have those bars. Freight service, Paul. All of the three unit former passenger units when the E8s came on board were assigned as freight units west of Marion. Okay. Um, but that still begs the question, why would they bother ordering a new set of freight F units? They, ordered, they later expand, very quickly expanded to a four unit set. They ordered a new set of F7s for passenger service, but then soon decided to go to E8s. Apparently that all was going on in the midst of those orders. And things were flat enough out there in the West, three units could handle what normally four would east of Marion. Well, yeah, the, the few photos I have of that 807 set, they're all in Indiana. So they yeah. were definitely working West End. It would have been pretty quickly changed to, uh, to freight. And I'll, and then they, they did get a fourth unit to go with that set. And I'll look up when that was delivered. That, and that was that, um, the one I point out, the 71 or 713C, which had the different uh, grills on it, right. which is why it kind of stuck out in pictures. <clears throat> Uh, I think that's all the questions. Hey, Paul, I have a question for you, if I may. Sure. Um, the picture of the switcher and Hornell, the only one that had the EL diamond on the nose. Mm -hmm. Um, what were those metallic shoes above the, like on the top part of the trucks? It was only on one truck um, and they, they look like shoes of some kind or something. I, I think I know Sean, let me just get the picture up, back up I so I can you. reference it. Uh, I believe, are you talking about the uh, re-railing frogs? Would they, would they hang them sort of on the top of the truck like that? Yeah. Um, hang on, my computer's going slowly now. Uh, they're actually not on top of the truck. They're, I'm still talking to something I'm not even looking at yet, so I'm just guesstimating here. Uh, hang it from the frame, right? Yeah, on the side of the frame, they had like little uh, strap metal hook that hung down and you just attached over the top of them if if it's what i'm thinking of so those uh, are railers then oh yeah all of yep. yep i'm looking at the picture right uh i can share the picture again uh so we can see what i'm talking about oh yeah yeah oh, those are railers so, Yep, you can see they got the little straps, like two strap hooks there that they just hang over. Hmm. Hey, thank you. I've, I've never really noticed that before, and that stuck out for me. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Yeah, a lot of railroads did that, and there's variation in placement of where they hung them. So I mean, it, it's a very variable thing, but that, that's what they are. They're, they're re-rolling frogs. Oh. I like their, their homemade uh, cardboard sunshade in the big cab windows, too. <laughs> and also their homemade uh, thing to keep the uh, radiator warm, the uh, whatever works. What if that guy's got class lights too? Yes, he does. <laughs> and that's also another somewhat unique thing. You don't see that all that often. Well, the, so the Alco switchers had them too. The, the Lackawanna guys like to use these uh, class lights. Paul, oh, back to the uh, 713 Charlie. That guy was delivered in February of 52, almost a year after the three unit set for it was delivered. So 
it was clearly an afterthought to add the fourth unit to that three unit set. Yeah. But, um, actually, Larry Young has some documentation with that order and explaining how that unit you know, be reconfigured as, in, as a 700 series four unit set as opposed to an 800 three unit set. But I, I didn't, didn't realize that the classes were based on locomotive size versus locomotive use, as in three unit set versus four unit set as opposed to freight versus passenger. That was kind of an eye opener for me. Are there any other questions? Oh, there's more questions in the chat box. Uh, I've seen the three, E33 three season EL colors with a blue band through the middle. Um, what you're seeing there, um, the EL, like I said, they were fast to repaint those their units when they got it. But when the DNH got the units from the EL in the first place, they took their sweet old time uh, in repainting. A lot of times they just uh, painted the maroon band gray, or not gray, blue, and stenciled the DNH lettering over it. Um, I think one of them didn't even get completely repainted. Um, it just had that blue repainted band and they painted a blue nose onto it. Uh, I know one for sure got the full DNH lightning stripe blue and gray, um, but they, the DNH didn't seem to be any big rush to put their image on those units. Did the U33Cs, U33Cs returning back to the EL run that way or were they immediately repainted? No, they were pretty much immediately repainted. I've seen no pictures of them in DNH paint running on the EL when they are returned. Uh, LCUP employee. And da -da. Sorry, I'm just reading the, the message. Okay, so the UP had uh, similar problems about uh, cars being blown up humps. So given the proximity of Lake Erie, I can see the all having the same issues at Bison. Yeah, I I, I definitely think we're, we're on something with that. Are there any shots of the 807 uh, on an Erie passenger train? No. Uh, I only have two photos of that 807 and they're both on freight trains and they're both in Indiana. Um, I don't think you will ever find a picture of that 807 passenger service. Uh, also, I want to point out that the 807 set did not come with steam generators. I have an overhead shot. There's no steam generator details on the, the roof of the unit. So it, I don't think it was purchased for passenger. It was, didn't have all the uh, equipment needed to act in passenger service. It, it was purchased as a three unit freight set. Um, it's just weird. Uh, are there any, uh, so if anyone comes up with answers for any of the questions I had, please, my, my email address is in the diamond. Um, drop me a line. Let me know. Um, I figure the more people I ask, someone is going to have to know reasons for some the questions I brought up. Um, but I, I, I actually appreciate all the commentary I've gotten from everyone on this call. I, it's, I've, it's been a good discussion. I kind of like this. Um, am I missing any questions? No, I think we got them all. If anyone has any questions or comments after, after it's put in the chat, I'll still be uh, looking for a little bit uh, and or drop me an email. Um, I'm available all the time at my email address. Uh, but otherwise, I think the bridge now, we're just going to leave the, the Zoom meeting open since a lot of us haven't seen each other in quite some time because of COVID. Uh, but this is pretty much a bull session open to everyone on the bridge. Feel free to discuss whatever you want, bring up anything you want, share anything you want. Uh, but I appreciate everyone coming. Uh, our next presentation uh, is currently scheduled for, look at my calendar here, March 27th, two weeks from today, same time, 11 a.m. 
it'll be Alex Prisgantas, who is going to be doing uh, historic photos of the Erie. Uh, but the difference here is they've been colorized. So it's kind of a looking at things through a new lens, so to speak. Um, Alex has presented before the society. He's a great presenter. I think uh, you'll enjoy the show. We have another show lined up, tentatively scheduled for uh, April 10th, which we'll announce at some future point. And uh, if anyone has a presentation or has a topic they'd like to discuss, uh, reach out to the society. We'd love to have you at one of these meetings. We're gonna, be, we're gonna try to do these meetings every two weeks or so um, for the foreseeable duration to kind of fill the gap of not being able to meet in person. Um, and I, I think today worked out pretty well. Uh, I appreciate the interaction with everyone. Thank you for attending. And I hope you guys all have a great day. I'll hang out for a little bit if anyone's going to chat about stuff. Uh, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks.